here we go. Wonderful. Okay, so to start with, I'm going to hand over to our lovely CEO, Katie Perry. Um, so Katie, would you want to take it away? Thank you, Lucy. So, so it's Women at Imperial Week, and obviously yesterday we um, we celebrated International Women's Day. Um, and I'd just like to really welcome you to this event and just tell you very, very briefly about two very special women at Imperial. So the first, obviously, is Daphne Jackson. Um, she was an undergraduate in physics at Imperial College, and she graduated in 1958 um, and then went on to do her research at uh, what was Battersea um, College of Technology and became the University of Surrey. And the other lady is Professor Betty Johnson, um, who was American um, originally and Betty was at Imperial College doing her Daphne Jackson Fellowship. So she had been in physics um, and had taken a break for a family caring um, health reason. And she was one of the first Daphne Jackson Fellows in 1986 and conducted her fellowship at Imperial College. Um, but she then went on after Daphne sadly died and she was very instrumental in setting the trust up. Um, she worked for 10 years herself as a coordinator Coordinator was the previous name of the, the role that uh, is now done by fellowship advisors. So, so Ros and Lucy and Julie, who are here. And then she became a trustee and she very sadly passed away in 2003. Um, so they were two very special women um, without whom we wouldn't be here today. And whilst the trust was originally set up to support women, um, without these two amazing women who set us up, we wouldn't have been able to grow and develop and become the organization that we are now. Every day, breaking the bias and now supporting not just women, um, but everybody, all returners, individuals who want to return to a career. So I'm basically gonna say they, they broke the bias. All of our fellows break the bias. It's something we are passionate about and we do every day. So in this week of Women at Imperial, I'm gonna hand over to my amazing women who run the trust. Basically, I'm the big head, they do all the work. Um, and, uh, and welcome to this event, everybody. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, that's great. Right, so uh, the, the sort of schedule for today is we've got uh, Roz, who is another fellowship advisor. She's going to give us a, a bit of a chat about the trust. And then we're going to hear from three, um, three of our fellows, one former fellow and two existing fellows at the trust. Um, so first of all, I'm going to hand over to Roz uh, and she's going to tell us some more about the trust. Thanks, Roz. OK, can you all see that screen? Perfect. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lucy. Um, yes, I am Roz, um, another fellowship advisor at the Daphne Jackson Trust. Um, and today I'm going to be talking you through some of the work that we do at the Trust um, to help break the bias that researchers who've had a career break can face when they're trying to return to their research careers. And let me click on that one. Right. So I already had a lovely introduction from Katie there um, to explain who we are um, and what we do. So we do offer these fellowships um, that are part time, they're flexible, they're two to three years. Um, we're quite unique in the way that we do it and how much we support our applicants and fellows and former fellows throughout the process. And we partner with universities, research councils, charities and learning societies to be able to support our fellows. And Katie's already given us a brilliant introduction about Daphne Jackson. She was an amazing scientist and an amazing trailblazer for women in research. And she, she had a fantastic career in physics, but during this career, she noticed that there were other talented female researchers in, in physics and engineering and in science in general who were, were being lost to research when they had their families. They weren't able to continue to um, continue with their research if they wanted to work part time. And I think at one point she likened it to imagining if Marie Curie had had a career break for children and then ended up working stuck in shelves in a supermarket rather than doing the amazing work that she did. And she recognised that this was a massive loss of potential, of talent and um, a waste of the education that, that these women had had. So she did something about this and she set up um, the first pilot scheme, as Katie said, at, at, at Imperial in 1986. Um, and she did sadly die in 91 and the trust was established um, in, her, in her memory to continue this inspired work in STEM, in science, technology, engineering and maths. And the fellowships continued, and they continued to change um, and, and progress. In 1992, our, our trust was established. In 2003, we, um, we expanded to um, allow applications for men as well as women. In 2019, we expanded to allow applications from the Republic of Ireland as well as the UK. In 2020, we have included um, all of the UKRI um, 
remit so we now can have applications from the arts, humanities and social sciences, meaning that any type of research, any researcher from any field can return to their research career, not just science, technology, engineering and maths, which is absolutely fabulous news. And last year we piloted a new type of fellowship, which is the technology fellowships, which are a retraining fellowship rather than a research fellowship, which we run alongside our standard fellowships. And we do have a brilliant um, relationship with Imperial. As Katie's already said, the first, the first fellow was at Imperial. And since then, we've had 20 Daphne Jackson fellows hosted by Imperial. We have six currently in post at Imperial, and we have two former fellows who did their research fellowships, they did the Daphne Jackson fellowships at other research institutions now working um, in, in, in research at Imperial. And we do have um, 437 fellows awarded um, so far in 91 different organisations. Uh, we're sponsored by 125 different sponsors, all of the, the UK research councils, the 20, 28 different charities and learned societies, 12 different private companies, and the remainder of our fellowships are sponsored by the universities that host them um, and other research institutions. Now, our fellows um, are a really diverse um, group of, of individuals. Um, the reasons for their career break are different. The duration of their career break is different, lasting from two to 21 years. How much research experience they had before they took their break really varies, with about a quarter of our fellows having had more than nine years postdoctoral experience before they took a career break and three quarters um, less, less than this. But they do have um, things in common. Um, to, have, to, to qualify for um, a fellowship, they must have had a PhD or equivalent research experience. They have to have left their research career um, for reasons of family, caring or ill health. Um, the break must have been for at least two years and they must be resident in the UK with a right to work in the UK. Now, our fellowships are unique um, because of the, the amount of nurturing that we give our fellows. We support fellows right from the word go um, we take into account all the individual differences they have, the reasons for their break, um, the career that they had and the career that they want. And this means that they can tailor make their own research proposal, um, allowing them to be retrained and to be competitive in the research field that they want to return to. Now, this slide um, was created by a former fellow, Anthony Wynne, who was sponsored by the BBSRC at the University of Plymouth. And it gives a clear, even clear overview of the rejection cycle um, that many of our fellows go through during their career breaks, which contributes to a lack of self-confidence and self-belief. Now, many fellows never actually intended to take a career break, but life happened to them. So just imagine you're on this lovely green line um, in your research career, you're getting um, postdoc after postdoc, you're getting your own fellowships, it's, it's all going marvelously. And then something happens, for example, you decide to start a family. And in Anthony's case, um, he, he, he took over the, um, the bulk of the childcare, which meant he needed to work part-time, which he found wasn't possible in the labs where he was working. So he took other work, part-time work. He was still applying for, for science jobs, um, but the fact that he wasn't currently working in one was working against him. It was stressful. He was rejected from many of these, these, these posts, which meant that months would go by, he'd apply for more jobs, but the gap in his career was getting bigger and bigger and causing more and more of a problem for him to, to be able to um, get his next research post. Now, we want to think about what it is, what are the barriers that prevent returners from being able to return to research careers, which ultimately means what are the barriers that are stopping employers from taking a chance on, on a returner to research? Well, we've had to think about these, these barriers and, and what seems to be um, perceived as, as potential issues are the childcare commitments that someone has if they've taken their break um, due to childcare. The fact they've had a break means they can be seen as being out of touch, as in not up to date in the current um, technologies and techniques. The career gap on their CV, it looks bad and it means that they don't have, um, up, don't have recent publications to prove for their scientific work. They don't have recent experience in the lab if that's the environment they're working in. If they are able to get a interview, um, despite these gaps in their CV, they may have a low self-confidence, low self-image, which means they might not perform as well at interview. And ultimately, these returners look very different to the standard applicants, and they look different to the people that are, that are looking to employ them. 
therefore they seem higher risk and they seem too different. And if there's a, a plethora of other candidates who have linear careers without a career break, then 99 times out of 100, that's who gets the job. Now, I think everyone looking at this slide can understand and believe that these issues exist, but it's really hard to quantify how big a barrier each of these issues are or whether we've captured everything in the first place. And at the Trust, we know this is anecdotal, but we want to know, are the barriers real? Do all returners experience them? And how on earth can we measure how significant they are? Well, our very talented project officer, Andy Clemson, undertook a project last year to do just that. So this was what we call the Barriers to Return to Research Careers project. And this survey was taken at the beginning of 2021. It was undertaken on a platform called Crowdoscope, which is like a collective intelligence software. And it means that you can use surveys in a much more intuitive way. So participants were able to answer a series of questions so we could find out their views on certain topic. And then they can see other respondents answers and then rate how much they agree or disagree with other people's answers. So all the participants were asked um, a discussion question. I've just missed out something really important. So to tell you who the people are we surveyed, um, it's that we surveyed all of the former Daphne Jackson Fellows and also the Wellcome Trust Career Reentry Fellows at the beginning of 2021. Sorry, to go back to that. So all the participants were asked a discussion question and given a free text to answer it. So the discussion question was, what do you think are the main barriers to career progression for research returners? And please explain why. We then asked the participants if they um, could have a look at other people's uh, responses. And they're then asked to evaluate how much they agreed or disagreed with other people's comments from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And then how much the barrier has impacted their own career progression from not at all to very significantly. In total, we had 102 different answers collected we collected the demographic data relating to gender, ethnicity and career stage also. And this information could then be ranked to find out more about the significance of the barriers and find out which were the most important and most impactful barriers. So please don't look at this slide. It's uh, just to show you the type of data, free text data that's collected, and how the key words can be extrapolated and the level of agreement and impact can be measured. And the key words that came out of, of this study uh, refer to age bias, to part time working, relocation, issues with short term contracts, work life balance, a lack of confidence and difficulty accessing funding. So a lot of what we thought from the previous slides is ringing true. Now, this shows the most commonly mentioned words ranked by level of agreement and impact level and the highest level of agreement was for funding, which is not surprising. Um, position and part-time came out very strongly here too. And we're starting to understand in a more nuanced way that returners are feeling the same pressures as all researchers, but perhaps a bit more keenly. Um, and the impact I had the strongest uh, ranking here was biggest in publications and in part-time. And we saw that the impact of the barrier is strongly correlated with how much this, which gives us a uh, confidence in these findings. And uh, publications, funding, position, part-time were the most significant to our returners. Now this graph is just to show that we admit that our survey is not perfect by any means. Um, we did survey demographic data and we found that there are many more white respondents than any other ethnic group and many more women, although that is reflective of our former fellow cohort as women are much more likely to have had a career break in the first place. But it does mean the barriers we've identified may be influenced by gender and ethnicity, so we should be interpreting it with that in mind. It was a very small group of answers and it's not big enough to look, unfortunately, at how ethnic identity might affect perceived impacts and barriers. So we do need much larger studies to be able to explore these really important intersectional issues. And just a note to say that this study was done at the beginning of last year, so in the middle of a pandemic, and we had about a third, um, third of the um, people we approached did respond. So in summary, the main barriers that we discovered from, from this project um, can be grouped into relocation issues, bias issues, and perceptions of part-time working. So relocation issues, we, the returners said that relocation is a significant barrier influencing their return into a research career in academia. 
there is a commonly held viewpoint that staying in a single institution for a long time is unambitious or lacking commitment. Um, and to have a more rounded research workplace experience is um, gives you the unwritten rule that you must have um, early career researchers moving between different institutions to work alongside different research groups, getting new experience and skills and forging new connections. And although this view obviously has merits for returners, the reality is often completely incompatible with their personal, obli personal obligations, such as raising the family, caring for relatives and dealing with health issues. The impact of relocation easily outweighs the merits. Impacts of moving home on a child's school, on a partner's job and their career, they may have a more stable income if they're not in research. The effects on local family and support networks, just to name a few. And this is compounded by the fact that many research contracts are obviously very short term meaning that relocation is simply not a practical option. Moving on to look at the biases, these can take numerous forms and occur through single or multiple lenses. Age bias is a serious problem. Most returners are by nature the fact that they've had a career break older than their colleagues at the same stage in their careers. And sometimes colleagues can misinterpret a returner's older age as somehow they may have failed early in their career, drawing false conclusions because they have fewer published papers particularly first or last author contributions, and a correspondingly lower H index. Some returners report they're less competitive when securing new jobs and promotions because of this, and matters are made even worse if the returner doesn't qualify for REF status. There can be a skills bias if returners require additional training to refresh their skills, experience, confidence, and management, and, um, and they have a sense of imposter syndrome because of this. The lack of role models, mentors, and support networks makes it even more difficult to feel a sense of belonging. Obviously, there's a gender bias. All too often, women returners can report that they're treated differently from their male colleagues. And the fear of being labelled as awkward can prevent many women from challenging this. Similarly, a fear of reprisal professionally in terms of securing new grant funding or being selected for promotion um, can deter women from pursuing complaints, particularly where the individuals can hold a position of power over them, such as their status on funding panels and appointment boards. Other forms of bias, including race, disability and sexual orientation, are hugely problematic still within academia. And these have not been overlooked by the omission here. But as I said earlier, the limitations of our, of our study meant that the number of responses didn't make these things overly, overtly mentioned. But we do know they are prominent and significant. So moving on to perceptions of part time working, it's still viewed negatively in many places in academia, despite it being commonplace in many other sectors. Those working in part-time positions report their colleagues can perceive them as being less committed or less interested in career progression. Some returners report that their managers have unrealistic expectations about what part-time research could mean in terms of research outputs. And in the worst cases, they expect them to have parity with full-time colleagues. The funding landscape is also heavily weighted towards full-time contracts. Returners say that peer reviewers can harshly judge part-time researchers with fewer outputs and less impacts. And the majority of research jobs advertised are on a full-time basis with very little effort made to welcome part-time applications. And this lack of part-time research positions at a senior level perpetuates the issue further. So here at the Daphne Jackson Trust, we are offering a rope or a ladder or a sledgehammer to get back into the research workplace. Some people just need an opportunity to rebuild their confidence, to get up-to-date skills and get more recent research experience and restore their self-belief. Integral to this process are the fellowship advisors. I like to think of us as a cross between cheerleaders and Yoda because we do offer advice and support, but we also importantly are always on the side of the, of the, of the returner and we're here to offer moral support and just the, the right words to keep moving forward. But we can't do this alone. And when Andy did this work, he came up with five things that everyone can do to help um, remove these barriers, five things for funders, five things for policy makers, for supervisors. And I'm just going to quickly go through, if I've got time, um, what, what, the, uh, what the universities can do and what the returners themselves can do to help remove um, these bar barriers and biases. So we would like to see universities improve their employment practices at all seniorities to encourage flexible working, part time and remote working, job sharing, compressed hours. If the pandemic has shown us anything, it's that flexible working is possible and it can be productive and it is the way forward. We'd like to see universities developing tailored support and well thought out family leave policies and childcare policies. We'd like to see reverse diverse mentoring to be able to, so that universities can have more information about the returners themselves. 
We'd like universities to consider well-being of equal importance with research output. Returners can feel a massive pressure to try and catch up, and this is often at the expense of their own well-being. We'd like universities to give more visiting researcher status to those on career breaks so they can maintain email accounts, access facilities and journal subscriptions, go to seminars, be able to network and learn about opportunities that are available. We'd like to see universities ensure that behaviour standards are clear, both the, the large scale reporting systems, but also we'd like to see um, more work done to deter subtle forms of bias, including microaggressions and other negative behaviours. Now, five things we'd like our returners to do. We'd love our returners to continue to embrace the trailblazer role that they have. The returners are a small but unique cohort of researchers that become mentors and role models of the future. And I'm very happy to say that several of our former fellows have gone on to become supervisors for new fellows and helping others to return through this path. We'd like to see our returners promote their skills and to be confident about the skills that they have, have that others might not have. The ability to juggle competing demands, to communicate e effectively, to handle stressful situations are vital skills in the modern research workforce. We'd like our, fellow, our, our returners to um, have fantastic career plans and be specific and realistic about those career plans, having plan A, plan B, plan C, and being agile in terms of the career choices post-fellowship. A role in academia may not be immediately available or suitable for everyone. We'd like our returners to be selfish. And by that, I mean be unapologetically, single-mindedly and professionally selfish. Promote themselves through every available avenue. Ask to be added to grants. Ask to speak at events. If there are full-time job opportunities, apply for those. And then when they've seen how amazing you are, then ask for part-time work if you need it. And we'd like our, our fellow our returners to continue to be flexible, flexible over working patterns, accepting that some compromise is, is inevitable and you will have to occasionally say no. Overall, what we want is for our fellows to continue to keep on going, to surround themselves with the positive, encouraging voices like the fellowship advisors, like the mentors, like the colleagues, like the other fellows, and to never give up. So, we were very happy to hear your views and ideas on how to support returners to research. And these are the ways that you can find out more about us or get in touch with us. So thank you. Thank you, Rose. That was great. <laughs> Thanks. That was really good. I think there's a lot of the issues that you brought up there that we, you can, we can identify with both as returners and or if you've not taken a career break. Uh, and also I, I do, I will now think of myself as a Yoda, Yoda character to people. So uh, thanks for that. <laughs> That's great. Right then, um, I'm aware of time and uh, we're sort of in the run up to lunch. Everyone's really quite hungry. Um, I'm going to crack on now, uh, hand over to uh, the first uh, of our fellow speakers. So this is the first speaker will be Hanadi Nixon. Uh, and she was she was a former fellow. So she was a fellow at Imperial between 2014 uh, and 2016 in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, with Professor Tony Cass. So, um, Hanadi, I can't, are you there? Oh, I can see you there now. I'll yes. hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? I hope. Um, thank you for this invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure um, to do something towards um, I'm Daphne Jackson and their enterprise in uh, empowering returners and career uh, returners to careers um, and for allowing me to participate at the Women at Imperial Week. Um, um, my, uh, can you, this weekend. sorry. Uh, So going back, so I believe that if you have the will, you will be able to pave your path. Um, um, and I'm going to be discussing with you uh, the why, why did we have a career break? What were the advantages of the career break? And what did the challenge I faced after the career break? So the career break, um, um, I had started a family and I was, even though uh, I was offered them, um, a full-time position at Imperial College, 
but then I started thinking, what do I do with the children? Um, I have all sort of what they call it, the imposter syndromes. I don't have children. How do I look after them? How am I going to cope to do full-time position? At that time, I didn't think that um, we can do a part-time research. So I thought, mm. and then start, started saying, okay, the salary, um, that will be three quarters of the salary will be going for a um, childcare. So instead of trying to think positively and negatively, I just thought negatively. Oh, it was all the bad things that could happen. Um, and so I sort of had to refuse because I thought I cannot ask my boss to do uh, part-time research because uh, that I'm talking about 15, 20 years ago, that was going to be a big no. I was thinking, okay, um, if I work full-time, I will never be able to publish a paper out of that because even if you're doing all the research during the day, you need to go back home and think of writing that paper, but with having children, that was impossible. I mean, it just all the sort of thoughts that I, I allow it to, to take, make me, me take this career break was basically all the negative thoughts. Um, um, so I decided to stay at home and I did stay at home for a long time as Rose has um, right, rightly said, there are lots of people one day decide to raise up a family. I am one of those average people of nine plus years who stayed at home. Um, uh, but there were some advantages um, or I say there were quite a lot of advantages as well, being at home. I raised up the children, I understood them, helped them. Um, I, in, I understood the community around me. I worked in the schools, uh, did voluntary work with the schools. So it also opened up my eyes to other side of life, apart from just uh, career and work, uh, where I knew uh, people, my neighbors, um, school teachers, um, supporting the school, um, being a school governor, I, we, I managed to establish playground, playgrounds for the children, new classes for the school. So there were some positive aspects of being um, at home. Uh, I did also part-time uh, tutoring. Um, that was a great experience as well, uh, uh, helping A-level students to go to universities. Uh, it's very achieving uh, feeling. Um, uh, also, I did a part-time position at Imperial Innovation. So even though I have not really rested being at um, having the career pass, but I got involved in other things, uh, but it wasn't research. Um, but then after a while, when the children slightly grew older, I decided I would like to do research. And I, I started to think about all the challenges. How do I go back? Who's going to have me after nine plus years break? Who's going to accept me? I, so I decided to retrain by doing voluntary work at St. Mary's Hospital. And that was a great, um, great thing I have ever done because through that, I knew about Daphne Jackson. Uh, there were some speakers who came over and talked about the Daphne Jackson and people who are returning to, to research after a career break. And that was it. I mean, that, I mean, Daphne Jackson is the best thing ever. And I'm really thankful. And I hope I can be of great help to this uh, trust because they have been wonderful in helping people, mentoring people, the advisors, and um, while you're writing your um, project, I mean, and the support while you're even doing your uh, your uh, fellowship at, at Imperial, it was great help, all the advice I got through them. Um, I went for training courses and it was sponsored by the, by the trust. So um, my thanks to this um, trust is going to be an eternal, uh, basically positive thinking as well. Um, so I was thinking after I finished with the fellowship, where do I go? Um, of course, academia is going to be the challenge because they won the papers and that was impossible for me to be able to do so many papers. I mean, my, my, my colleagues at the, at the department then were having 35 papers. They were applying for lectureship positions. So I decided, I will, I'll rather go for academia, uh, for um, industry rather than academia. And so um, after the, the fellowship, after the fellowship, I, uh, and I worked during the fellowship in academic research, developing biological sensors for acid treatment. Uh, and I'd like to let the trust know that at last my paper has been published uh, last month. So I'm still very happy about that. Yes, thumbs up. But um, that was a challenge uh, trying to do a part-time position 
trying to um, look for the children after the children because they were still young um, and looking for um, you know, for um, part, um, position in industry was a challenge. I have to say, you just have to be strong enough and not let it break you. You just have to be strong enough because it was not easy to every, I have never applied to a position and not got an interview. I got interviewed every time, but always that letter of, oh, we are sorry and we're sorry. And there is always somebody who has been doing that work before you and he has got more eight months of experience or maybe one more or two, three years of experience. And hence it was like, like opening doors, but then they get closed, opening doors, but don't give up. There is always a door that will open for you. And I ended up now I'm working at uh, BioNano Consulting. It's an aqua firm uh, company where we are doing biological sensors for uh, drinking water and uh, for drinking water and uh, measuring the arsenic concentration so that people get advised if they can drink from that water or not. And arsenic is a big problem in, in Asia, South America, um, parts of West Africa. So it is a global problem and uh, for people who use groundwater for drinking. And I'm very happy to participate towards such a noble cause uh, in uh, developing this biological sensor. Um, and I would like to say thank you again for listening to me and I'm happy for any questions. Thanks, Anadi, that was great. Really nice talk and it's, uh, it's really nice to, I think that the trust does is to stay in touch with fellows even after they've gone on and to hear about the success in their careers. So it was really nice to hear from you today. Okay, are you okay just to stop sharing the screen and then perfect, that's great, thank you. Right, um, what we'll do is we'll save all questions to the end. Um, so we'll have a Q&A session after our last, uh, after our last speaker. Um, right now we'll move, move on to Richard Matthews. Um, so Richard is a current fellow in the Department of Chemical Engineering uh, with Professor Jason Hallett. And Richard, I'm gonna hand over to you. Yeah, thank you. Just try to share this with me. Can everybody see that? Okay. So I just want to say thank you very much for in inviting me to give this talk today. Um, I'm currently a third year engineering, um, well, third year Daphne Jackson fellow in the engineering department, um, working with Jason Hallett. And I'm sponsored by the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, so this is a background. So one of the other things that has been mentioned is pretty much the flexibility, um, having the work-life balance, and trying to juggle a family and research has been very important. And thankfully the Daphne Jackson Fellowship has allowed me to do that in the last couple of years. Um, it's also allowed me to retrain in computational methods that I used during my original postdoc and also to learn new skills, especially programming and um, management and how to run a research group. Um, one of the other op opportunities has allowed me is to actually have few publications um, so it's very good and the networking um, which is one of the biggest problems when you have a career break is you break all those ties with the research groups a lot of the time and so to actually rebuild those so the Daphne Jackson Fellowship has allowed me to come back and actually build up those networks again and start new networks so a little bit about maybe for my career break so I went the traditional academic pathway I had a did an um, undergraduate in South Africa in Pretoria. Then I went and did a master's and PhD in Cape Town, moved to Imperial for four years to do a research associate position in chemistry. And then my son was born at the end of 2014 and I took a career break. Um, that was originally supposed to be a couple of years um, and it ended up being about four years for various reasons. And then I thankfully, got the opportunity with Daphne Jackson Fellowship and returned to Imperial towards the end of 2019 and I'm currently still there. Um, the main reasons for taking that career break was effectively to play an active role in my children's early development. My wife and I were both um, sort of brought up with our mothers at home and I was lucky with my father, he worked part-time. So he was able to always have an active role in my life. And I thought this was gonna be very important for my, uh, for my son 
the first son and then we had the second son and as you see now I've got my third one who's 18 months old and we always have that opportunity to have at least my wife or myself at home with them and it's helped tremendously in developing a relationship with them and in their early development especially with basic skills with reading and talking. Um, one of the other reasons for taking the break was that my wife is a GP and she was in her final year of GP training when our son was born. And for her to maintain a career progression meant that she had to be there full time. There, were, there was no way that they would allow her to sort of do the training on a part time basis. So it made sense for me to actually take a step back and allow my wife to progress to the point where she could be then a qualified GP. And then we could reassess where the career break, who would take a career break if we needed to, or if we could work flexibly. And thankfully with the Daphne Jackson Fellowship, it's allowed both of us to actually work flexibly for the last three years and to be actively involved with the kids. So some of the activities that I actually undertook when I was doing the break was, I took full-time care of my children, majority of the time. I did some freelance editing, which was quite, nice at the time because it allowed me to be very flexible in what I was actually doing um, and I could keep involved in science even though it was just editing research papers for for research groups from around the world it was fun and enjoyable I could keep up with some of the science as I was going along one of the other things I did for a, a short three-month period was I, I took on an hourly paid lectureship at University of Greenwich to help with some of the physical chemistry lectures just just to fill in for some of the staff who were were away at the time and I was also actively involved with the Masters Hockey, International Masters Hockey with the Wales men's over 35s as a manager and a player. Mm. So I did have the free time to actually be able to do those sort of things that research, a full-time research position probably wouldn't have allowed me to do. So one of the big biases and challenges I found in, in returning to science was actually the major rejection. When I was trying to return, I did over 20 job applications, got three interviews and was rejected every single time. And most of the time I was told my skills were outdated. And the longer I went in having a career break, the more outdated they went, even though the computational methods hadn't actually changed in those sort of four or five, you know, the four years that I'd been off. Um, the other thing was I was too high risk because I've been out of research for too long. People don't want to take a chance in academia. And even though I was coming along sometimes with my own projects, I was always told that they were too ambitious and I wouldn't be able to meet the timelines because I was out of work for so long. I was always sort of just not brushed off, but it was just, you know, they, they were very sort of negative towards the having the career break. The other things that I found very difficult was if I wanted to do a fellowship, um, I was always advised to get a university research fellowship or uh, Dorothy Hodgkin's fellowship and doing that needed writing a proposal and I needed time and sort of my own patience especially with having the children around and those weren't available at the time you can't write a, a full-on fellowship application when you don't have the the flexibility um, so it it was always very very challenging in in that regard once I found the Daphne Jackson fellowship I was able to Get the support I needed, and I then could approach the um, Imperial and find a sorry, <laughs> find a, a, a supervisor who was actually willing to help me to build up a research um, proposal. And along with the fellows, advisors, and the Daphne Jackson Trust, I was able to actually put it all together. And then I started my fellowship. And one of the biggest problems I found in the first sort of six months was imposter syndrome. I, I you know, you. You think you've, you've been keeping up with all the science and everything, but as soon as you're back in that environment, it's how do I actually get going again? What, you know, what do I do? And thankfully I had a lot of positive support from the advisors and from um, Jason Hallett in particular and, and Tom Walton who were around you know, at the time to help in having discussions. Um, one of the other big challenges that I found was generally the childcare management. Uh, having moved over from South Africa 10 years ago, we don't have extended family in the UK. So a lot of it fell on, on my wife and myself. And thankfully, both the university and, and the research group I was in was actually quite flexible in allowing me to not have to stick to fixed days of work. So whenever we did have a problem, 
I could work from home and I could get on and do, you know, my research. So the Daphne Jackson Fellowship has allowed me to actually have that flexibility while being able to maintain, you know, looking after children and childcare involvement. Um, but I think one of the most important things that has come out of the Daphne Jackson Fellowship is that always been very positive support. And that has come from the trust itself and from um, a lot of academics that are, are willing to invest in actually taking on part-time researchers and getting them back into science. I, I think one of the biggest challenges though for the universities is actually getting involved in and how the funding um, how the universities can fund it. And I think Imperial has stepped up in the last couple of years and has, has started helping in that regard. And I think it can only go, uh, become more positive over the next couple of years. Okay, and end there. Thank you very much. Listen. That's great, Richard. Thank you. Um, that was really good. I think that was an amazing, fantastically professional uh, presentation there. Uh, really showing off your uh, your multitasking skills there. <laughs> so well done. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so as I said, we'll, we'll hold questions to the end. Um, and then so we're now coming up to our, our last talk, uh, and that's from Mardi. And Mardi uh, is another current fellow uh, at Imperial. She's in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, uh, and she's with Pro Professor Daniel Dini. Mardi, I'll hand over to you. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for having me. So uh, let me share my presentation. I have to remove. Uh, is it there now? Yeah. Um, so, um, well, actually um, my uh, um, problem was something else. Um, I had my children uh, prior to my PhD, so I encounter with all these issues uh, before starting my PhD. Um, so what happened was I, I really liked doing research and doing PhD. And um, because of that, we moved from um, like um, um, Iran to uh, UK. Um, after my PhD, uh, so my husband wants to establish the business. And um, I was war um, also I was um, waiting for the contract with the industry that I was working before to be signed. So during that time, I started to uh, help my family and running uh, the things that they need. And um, so two things happened at the same time. One was the cancellation of the project because of the, uh, some internal issues that they have in the company. And the other one was I became quite involved with the uh, work in, um, and business work. And um, if we were at the stage that they couldn't actually pay someone to do the job. And I decided to stay and help my family until everything becomes uh, normal and um, you know, um, I can help them uh, this way. So after two years, I decided to come back to the research and um, it was actually the first time that I realized that coming back is quite difficult. Um, I applied for several uh, different uh, works and I you know, contacted many different people, tried to have interviews with them. And, and the last interview that I had with um, one of the people, he told me that you work with like two great supervisors. If you are valuable, they would work with you again. And uh, but by the way, he said it in a very nice way. Well, he was true, actually. Um, so um, I don't have that much experience after my PhD and um, I don't have publications. I didn't attend conferences, networking and anything, any of that, but they, they knew me. So um, I went to my supervisors and they recommended me to apply for the fellowship. And I found that Daphne Jackson fellowship which really changed everything to me. Uh, when I contacted the Daphne Jackson Fellowship, I was expecting to you know, experience the same things that I had before, like they like interview and then it's just like a rejection. But I was surprised with the level of support that I achieved and um, they helped in every step and it was kind of, a training itself, the application of this Daphne Jackson uh, fellowship. 
And especially um, when we have the career break and um, you join the university again with the flowship, it helps you a lot um, to say that you can um, get the fellowship and it's much more, um, although the level is the same as postdoc, but having this fellowship name under your like signature can help a lot in contacting and networking. Uh, but there are also different challenges when um, um, I started my work. The first one was um, like I was expecting myself to go through like publications and I started to work in that. And when I started, I realized that I forgot many things, much more than what I was expected. So it's refreshing the science, the training, they are quite difficult. And also um, training new um, things, which I, you know, changes a lot in my department from like the conventional simulations to machine learning, data science. So I had to train myself, but after a while, I think after six months, seven months, I, I could say that I could prove myself, I, on, on, on track and um, the two different things I found quite important is if you contact anyone you have to have recent publications um, and how much background you have doesn't work really they need something recently and um, I think the most important thing for me is to uh, focus on what I'm doing having the publications and at the same time, um, just network with other people to find the funding, like securing the funding for the next step um, is quite important, which is quite challenging. And uh, yeah, that's it. Well, I was very sure. Thank you so much. Oh, that's great, Madi. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your kind word about the trust. Um, and also just picking up on the fact that the the whole application process with us is also part of the retraining. It's not just the fellowship itself. Um, and then that's, that's an important part of what we do. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, right, I'm now going to open it up um, to a bit of a Q&A session. If anyone has any questions, um, if you can either you put it in the chat or if you raise your real hand or your virtual hand, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll ask the speakers to comment on that. So. Um, I well, just while we wait for some questions to come in. Um, Can I start? Sorry, Lucy. Yes, so I, please, I was going to, Hanadi, you didn't continue in academia after your fellowship. You went into industry. How did you go about doing that? And sort of, how did you actually get the job in industry? Um, um, it was um, basically um, through a fellow contact. I, he was working with me at the um, uh, at Imperial. We were both working with Professor Tony Kaz, and then. Um, when my fellowship was coming to an end, they asked me if I would like to join as a part-time consultancy base, which I did. Uh, but then luckily within three months of that, uh, they wanted me to be a permanent member of staff with them. Oh. Yes, yeah. uh, so um, I would recommend networking. I mean, I understand people who are working on uh, uh, Daphne Jackson, they have a limited time to be able to do research and try to do the reading and then, you know, it's. An, being 50%, but any opportunity you can get uh, to meet up with people or to go to small conferences or just, it's really important even to manage uh, talking with people in the department or in the college. People know people and people find, trying all the time to find people who can do the jobs for them and help them with their uh, research or with their work. So I would say, I recommend networking is very important part during the fellowship years. That's great. That's great. Thank you. I think there's a couple of um, questions in the chat. Do you want to pick this up, Lucy, or shall I? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll do the first one. So um, I, I think it's safe for you to ask the first question. So if we could direct this to to the three fellows, maybe um, Richard or Marty, as you're, you're still in your fellowship. Um, what was the one thing about the first year of your fellowship that you either think is a good thing to do or should be avoided? So I say about avoiding things first. I think one of <laughs> one of the things that that came up was you sort of you don't get pressured necessarily. You feel your own pressure about doing too many research projects at the same time, and actually saying yes to things outside of what your fellowship project is. Um, first and foremost, you're there to research the project that you you you've written up, um, and it's fine to get involved with other projects. 
to to a lot of networking and things. But I think I had a lot of advice from Jason in terms of, you know, you might be taking on too much, you know, scale back, make sure you, you can meet your own sort of goals first and then help other people beyond that. And I know, um, so that, that was one of the avoiding things from, from a positive thing was actually getting out and talking to people in other research groups. And I know it's been really difficult in the last two years. So I was at Imperial for six months and then they essentially shut down campus <laughs> with, with COVID and sent us all home. And because we're, I can do all my work computationally, I don't need to actually be on site. So then you start losing the connection with people. But I think the, the first six months was very instrumental in meeting people in other research groups, going to some of the, the smaller courses that are offered by the postdoctoral fellows, um, PFDC, I can never remember, Development Center, there we go. <laughs> and, and, you know, actually meeting other people. So I met one of the other postdocs in um, Claire Agerman's group very early on in the first three months I was there. And we still, you know, in contact at the moment. And, and the advantage there is that they, we both do computational chemistry to some degree, but I do it um, more fundamental why he does application base. So you, you start to build up these networks and how you can actually collaborate together and build up your, your um, sort of, as I say, well, your networks. That, that was the one thing that I do recommend doing. And the postdoctoral fellows development center facilitates those sort of things getting involved in the small courses that they have. That's great, Richard. Thank you. Good advice there. Mardi, do you have any, any sort of advice there? I have something similar as Richard. The only thing that I would avoid, um, or I would say that it's better to uh, postpone it for the second year is contacting the people who you want to work with them uh, just before you have another publication and you um, actually shows that you prove yourself that you can do this. Because um, they might come very nicely to say, like, I um, apologize, but um, it might not be the case in the next six months. So uh, be a bit more patient, get in track, and then try to um, expand the work that you are doing. That's what I can say. That's great, Marty. Thank you for that. Um, another question that I've seen uh, this is from uh, Tasman. Um, she says, it's a really good question, actually. After your career break, um, are you sure that you wanted to go into science? And I, I think also, if I could sort of expand that question, after your fellowship, are you still sure that you wanted to be in science? And so, Hanadi, do you want to answer that one? Um, yes, to, um, to go through that, what I did is, before I decided um, uh, after, the, after the career break, okay, do I really want to go back to science? So I went and uh, did the voluntary work with, at St. Mary's for six months, and that made me know for sure that that's what I want to do, research. So I exposed myself to the experience of um, um, knowing other people who are doing research. I was helping like a teaching, like as an assistant, sorry, research assistant. And that really helped me realize I still have the passion for research. I still have that kind of, still a bit of my brains is still working in that scientific way um, that I would like to go on science. And that is really what intrigues me. So it is good sometimes to go through this. I mean, I worked as well at Imperial Innovation as an uh, admin job, and I realized, no, I'm not fulfilled here. I would like to go back to career, to in a career in science. That's great, thank you. Mardi. Um, well, actually I had chance to work outside the scientific areas and I actually earned too many, you know, I, I could get too many different uh, skills. Um, but at the end, I realized that this is not what I feel um, happy with that. And I'm, I have passionate about the science, that's why I get the PhD. Um, so, um, so I decided to come back and I'm happy to do it. But the only thing that um, I'm very happy also to have those years of uh, experience outside the research and academia um, it was quite useful because I had the connections with other people outside the balloon that we had and now people are thinking differently, they need differently. So um, when I came back, I have more science, you know, I like science and research, but I, I also like the applications of the science and research. So it makes things a bit more different 
in terms of commercialization and thinking about the future. Uh, but no, definitely, I like the science and research. That, that's great, Martin. I think it's a really good point as well that uh, often we look at career breaks as being sort of a, a difficult thing to overcome, but actually you gain a lot of different skills there, whether you're staying at home with family or whether you go out and do something else. There's a lot of really useful skills that you can bring back to research after that. True. And Richard. With the, with the career break, I, I was certain that I wanted to come back to research. Um, and one of the things I found was when I was doing this, some of the freelance editing was that I was very interested in the science that was coming from all the different fields, but it wasn't my own. I wanted to be doing my own research and actually continuing with that down the line. Um, and doing the lecturing at University of Greenwich was a great opportunity to show me that I actually enjoyed the teaching as well. Um, so it meant going back and trying to get back into academia and follow down that path. Um, and I have looked at other careers. I've got friends who are involved in, in Taylor and Francis edit you know, the journals and they look for content, um, content acquisition officers all the time and they, they are looking for people. Um, and I have spoken to them about it, but when they actually talk to me about what the job is, it's, it's not what I want to be doing. I want to be doing the academic career with teaching and a little bit of research involved. That's great, thank you. Okay, uh, oh, there's another question just popped up. Um, I wanted to ask Richard if he thinks he'll be in a position to apply for any early careers funding after fellowship, or do you anticipate any barriers due to the career break or part-time research? I think with the early careers funding, the, the two options mainly, at, at the University Research Fellowship um, and the Dorothy Hodgkins, which I looked at from the Royal Society, they, they, they shouldn't be any problems. They, they've now become a lot more flexible and are offering part-time um, fellowships over, over the five to eight year period, it, however long they're actually to fund it. So I don't think those would actually be problematic. The biggest problem is the, the competition and, and they're highly competitive fellowships. They are also the EPSRC fellowships now where it's open-ended um, in terms of when you can apply for them. And those, those might be a good option. Um, and I think they're also starting to look at more part-time research. But at the moment, I, I would consider going as a part-time researcher for the next couple of years, um, unless something full-time comes up that definitely take. So, but I, I, I don't think there are that many barriers other than the, as long as I, I, I think one of the big things that I find is that as long as you can publish one or two papers during a, a Daphne Jackson Research Fellowship, you, you do start to show that you can publish work. And I think the, the funding bodies are becoming more open to um, people having had career breaks and understanding that it takes a little bit longer to get those publications back up on, on track. So you, you would sort of probably get a little bit more leeway now than maybe about five, six years ago where everybody was like, the, you know, these are the criteria. If you don't meet them, that's it. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Richard. I've just noticed Samara, you've got your hand up. Yes, just last, um, well, very fascinating presentation. Uh, when you keep talking about your challenges you had and the pleasure of the joy of the research and uh, the way when you got your fellowship, like it just brought me some nice memories, very, very nice memories. And um, I recently I, um, uh, I, 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 I am reading a book, which I would like to share it with you. I was about to text it, um, sending an email to Rose. She's my advisor. Um, but I think like this is a good opportunity. It's called Professor Mummy. So this book is how it's called the Professor Mummy. It's been recommended to me by one of the colleagues in the university where I'm working, Bergbeck. And this is really good, to, gives you a really good approach of managing the work with uh, between research and academia. And it's get very, very, it's very, very highly, um, um, got very high motivation spirits. So um, I can, once I finish it, I can give like all of you, if you'd like a presentation on the top um, or the, um, you know, uh, the top keys I found in that book that might help uh, uh, all of us. So yeah, thank you, Lucy. So this one's called Professor Mummy. 
It's really, really nice book. And I actually, as uh, like we applied most of the strategies, but it come it, because we didn't know that it's been it's been proven like scientifically that we have to do that, but it just like naturally comes. But it's it's help it's help you a lot. This is what I wanted to share with with you all. Yeah, thank you. That's great, Samara. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the time. We just sort of run slightly over 12, unless anybody has any other questions. Um, I'd just like to thank, say thank you again to all the speakers. They were really, really, really interesting and lovely talks from everybody. So thank you. Thank you to all our speakers today. Um, so this is being recorded and I think the, the chat is also saved um, so we can revisit it. Or if you have any other questions, um, most of you know who we are. Please do, do see our website if you'd like to see find anything else out about the trust and what we do or how to apply. But other than that, thank you all for joining us. Um, I'll say goodbye. Uh, and I think just a few of us will just stay on just to debrief. <laughs>